Well, I'm here today with Jared Saft. Jared, thank you so much for taking your time to be here with us. I appreciate it. I'm curious, uh, you got a lot of kids. How are you sleeping? I'm sleeping better than my wife. And our number is, what are we? Three, three girls. I tell everybody, I think I'm being punished for everything I did wrong, you know, when I was, was young. But truthfully, you know, everyone talks about, you know, wanting to have, oh, I want a boy, I want a boy. And then I had my first girl and I was like, she's amazing, I want another one. You know, and I, I've been right. so blessed to have three girls. I mean, what's nice about having kids, especially girls, is you can kind of mold them. Right. So like, they're Beatles fans, yeah. you know, they like the same things that I do. They like chicken wings, you know, like that. So you, you're really influencing oh, the yeah. important thing. Yeah, my older one, you know, she'll eat sushi and jalapeno, you know, like you can kind of like make them the humans you want them to be. Yeah. It's like creating your own. And is your wife all right with that? Does she kind of just allow you to, to do that? I mean, she could be totally unwinding it when I'm not there, but no, she, she, she's good. You know, good. We, we, I'm, I'm very blessed. I, I married like an equal partner and we have an amazing marriage. And very, very nice. I, I feel so blessed that, that I found her. So. so, you know, a lot of people, uh, including myself, I'm very curious. You're, you're young, uh, which is good. You started here fairly young as well. Walk us through kind of like, how did that happen? What was your progression like? Any hiccups? In, in this little journey? Because I think sometimes people assume like, oh, there's Jared. Oh, Jared's at this level. It must have happened pretty quick. Well, it never feels quick in, in the moment, right. you know? And, um, you know, I, I started here in my mid-20s. I had gotten a uh, college degree at Emory and then a uh, graduate degree at Brown. So right. a lot of right. hard work uh, so that's there. A lot of school. Yeah. Lot of school. Lot of all my money went there <clears throat> uh, and, and all my student loans and all that. Right. Uh, worked all throughout uh, high school. I worked at uh, Houston's yeah. Houston's I restaurant. Okay. I, I, I was a, a host there, so were you really? I was. Which okay. again, you want to talk about people who are annoyed? There's been a wait at Houston since I was in high school. <laughs> um, worked retail. Worked at uh, where? I worked at Banana Republic. Did you really? I did. Yep. Back when that was a cool yeah, place that to work. Was the real, yeah, back in the day. That was the place. Yep. Um, and worked in uh, warehouse packing boxes. So I had a lot of unique and different jobs. So how did you even get started with Westgate? I think that's one of the questions that I've never been able to ask you. The, the truth is I was dropped in a basket on David's doorstep <laughs> when I was little. No. <laughs> he's done He's done right by yeah, you. Yeah, no. Um, I, I met David Siegel actually kind of by happenstance. Uh, he was running a uh, executive, uh, an executive retreat up at Foxwoods. And it's a really funny story. The first time I, I met David Siegel, uh, he borrowed my car. And I had no idea who he was. And I had this little little red convertible, and um, they're like, hey, David Siegel's gonna borrow your car. I'm like, who the, who the heck is David right, Siegel? Right. And uh, he drove off in my car, and someone said, well, don't worry about it. If he crashes it, he'll probably buy you a nicer one. Uh, and that so was the first hoping, time I met him. Yeah, at that right? point, I was probably hoping he crashed my car. That's but funny. that was the first time I met him, and um, met the entire executive team that weekend uh, when they were up there. I was finishing my graduate degree up in uh, Rhode Island and had, okay. had the opportunity to meet all these guys. And David said to me, you know, after getting a chance to uh, talk to me a little bit, and he said, why don't you come down to Orlando and, and, and come check out the operation and see what you think. And at that point, I thought I was going on vacation. I really didn't know I was going on a job interview. Okay. Uh, and about halfway through that trip, he's like, well, we're going to Vegas, you're coming with us. And I'm like, okay, I don't even have a jacket. It was cold and he's like, bar my jacket so he literally took away uh, every excuse I had to not so you had to go that's right and then um, about halfway through the trip on the way back he's like I want to offer you a job and I'm like okay you know I'm, I'm listening and went through the opportunity and everything and I really liked it but I said to him you know the the challenge I have is uh, I, I have six months left of my graduate degree and I've spent a lot of time and more importantly a lot of money uh, right, finishing right, to, and, and right. I want to finish my degree. Right. And so he said to me, I'll tell you what, if you can work with your program, uh, you can work for me four days a week and you can fly up to Rhode Island and, and do all your classwork and everything on the fifth day. So for about six months, I worked for David on Monday and Tuesday. Tuesday night I got on uh, Southwest, flew to Providence, went to school Wednesday, um, uh, flew back Wednesday night, worked for David Thursday, Friday, and did that every week for six months. Did you really? And, and that's one of the things I love about David is, you know, he, he had enough faith in me to give me that opportunity yeah, and nice. in a very unconventional way. And, and hopefully 13 years later, he, he feels he made the right decision. Give me a quick snapshot on how you plan out your week. Like, what's your day-to-day -day look like? Because I want to kind of 
at least expose some of that for the viewing audience that we have. Yeah. I want them to understand like, how do you plan your week? What typically is a priority for you? And, and just what's your day to day kind of like? My life is divided between the time I'm traveling and the time I'm not traveling. And right. so the time I'm traveling just throws schedules out the window. But um, in terms of when I'm here, uh, every morning I try to be with our operations team in the call center, dealing with the issues that they have, you know, meeting with them, focusing on that. So I, I divide my day in half, kind of by lunch. Lunch yeah. is my mental break yeah. usually. Yeah. Um, and you know, so in the morning, it's looking at reports. And I always tell people, reports tell you what questions to ask. They don't tell you the answers. Right? Interesting. Like, and and so reports are really where you start, not where you finish. Right. Um, so you start off with that. Yeah. And, okay. And so sense. From there, rolling into meetings, you know, yeah. spend a lot of time, like I said, uh, working with uh, outside groups and, and trying to coordinate, you know, everything, right. you know, not just within my organization, but really interfacing with the rest of uh, Westgate. Yeah. Uh, my afternoons are spent uh, here at the corporate office, and, and that's really when I get an opportunity to work with Mark and David and Tom and Jim and Richard and Steve and everyone else yeah. directly. Yeah where we can you know, then kind of bounce ideas off each other and hey, what's going on? You're seeing this, I'm seeing that. Uh, solve challenges and problems, yeah. which invariably every organization has. And so really, I see my mornings dedicated to my team and my afternoon dedicated to the more global Westgate. But for you, what's been the best piece of advice that you've been given? The best piece of advice I was ever given was, you know, approach every job or whatever you're doing at that moment as it's the most important thing that you will ever do. Where have you struggled here? Like, what do you struggle with in your job? Everyone assumes that, okay, you're at a certain level, you're good to go. That's so not true. No, it actually, the problems get harder and they worse. They get worse. Yeah. There are two areas where I think I tend to not struggle, but where I have my opportunities and challenges. Number one, I think I've, as part of my responsibilities, I've taken on a more progressive role in, in bringing and bridging Westgate with the rest of the industry in terms yeah. of timeshare. Yes. And so yes. it takes a lot of time and energy of, of my day to reintroduce who Westgate is to the wider community, whether it is the hospitality industry, yeah. the hotel industry, yeah. our timeshare peers. Uh, I've been very lucky uh, to represent us on the ARTA Board of Directors, which is the American nice. Resort yeah. Development Association. Yeah. And so dealing with a lot of industry level issues now. I'm reminded of the, the movie Jurassic Park and, yeah. and there's, there's a line where Samuel L. Jackson is saying, we have all the problems of a zoo and a theme park. True. And I feel that way about Westgate sometimes, right? Yeah, like, you know, we have all the challenges of being a hotel organization, Absolutely. plus all the challenges of being a timeshare sales and marketing organization, yeah. plus yeah. all the challenges of being a yeah. mortgage and debt collection yeah. organization, yeah. all the challenges of being a homeowner's association, of a IT development, That's true. Uh, you know, interior design and construction. Like we have the problems of everybody, yeah. as opposed yeah. to like one set of problems. Yeah. And so that's a very good analogy. Yeah, it, it, it's that's one of the biggest analogy. things that we need to figure out. You know, as as an industry, it's not even really a Westgate problem. Is how do we solve cross you know industry problems in very complex organizations? Think of two or three things that you just know you rock, you get right more times than not when it comes to your business. I think one of my strengths is taking complicated problems and trying to make them in a way that's palatable and, 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 and approachable and, and attackable, right? right? right. And that's if, you know, you didn't ask me the question, but I'm going to give it to you. Go. What do you love about Westgate? I love our complicated. do that, by Okay, the way. well now I preempted it. That's fine. It. That's fine. <laughs> that's okay. Keep going. Uh, you can answer the question. No. <laughs> I, um, I like solving complicated problems, and I think one of the things I can do for the organization and I enjoy is taking our complicated problems and finding a way to, you know, uncomplicate them and find a plan of attack to go after yeah. them. And so when you look at the different properties, any property, any of the positions mm -hmm. that you could do, that you'd want to do, or maybe not want to do, or you're envious of the people that do them, yeah. you don't know how they do them, yeah. tell me. It's actually a really easy question for me to answer. Okay. Um, when I was a kid, okay, I, this is going to sound bizarre, okay. I thought the coolest job in the world was the guy who, when you went on a vacation, like a ski vacation, picked the people up from the airport and drove them 
to the resort. I always wanted to be there at the beginning and, and, and kind of have that repartee with, with people as they were starting their vacation. Okay. When it comes to Westgate as a timeshare, because I'm an old timeshare guy, like mm -hmm. I sold timeshare prior to, to getting into recruiting, mm -hmm. so I still get excited when I go to some of the properties and I get onto the sales floor, like I legitimately start looking to see who has a deal and who doesn't. What do you see for the company as far as the timeshare side of the world? Even if if you think about the way that we sell timeshare, because you've got a complete different generation that's coming out. Yeah. You know, I'm reading articles on the millennials on how they buy timeshare, how they view timeshare. Like, what are your thoughts around that? Yeah. So, I interesting question. And, um, you know, timeshare is an evolving product. Yeah. When it first came out, it was fixed week, fixed unit. You come now, this is it. You don't yeah. come any time later. Yeah. And it's been an evolution to, all right, I'll don't necessarily have to be in that unit, but I'm going to come this week to, hey, I'm going to come anytime in the season to, hey, I'm going to split my week. I'm going to lock my week off. I'm going to buy a two bedroom and come one week in a one bedroom and one right. week in a studio. So right. it's been this evolution. Um, I think that'll continue. Um, you know, Westgate as a whole will be doing our first um, uh, right to use product. So we'll be selling a 50 year right to use in New York as opposed to a fee simple deed, okay. uh, which is a huge departure. I mean, Very talk about complex challenges, uh, not just from a sales standpoint, but from a technology and, and servicing right. standpoint, totally different. So right. that's kind of the evolution of the product. And, and I see us going into more of those unique product forms. So Jared, you know, when you're out and about, when you're getting to these, when you're getting to these other properties and you're, and you're meeting the different individuals from different departments, you're going to get a lot of information. You're probably going to get a lot of opinions. You're going to get a lot of feedback. What's some of the toughest feedback or some of the harder things that you've heard, you know, since you've been here, or maybe in the last year, the last couple of years, or maybe in the last few months? Right. But what are some things that, that you're listening to, that you're hearing, that might cause you to lose a little sleep, or might get you uncomfortable, and you have to uh, think about some things? It's when I talk to one of my call center agents, or when I meet someone at the yeah. resorts, and they give me yeah. a challenge, and I know they're right, but I don't have a quick fix for them. And I'm like, man, that person is going to go to work tomorrow thinking that I either don't understand the issue, don't care, or right. I don't have a fix for them right. when I just want to be like, look, I will get to it. We will sort this out, but I don't have an immediate answer to that right. problem. And, right. and that's hard because I hope they don't then go home and say, oh, he didn't care. He, you know, he, he heard me, but what happened? Yeah. When people tell me things, I, I take them to heart. And Do you really? I, absolutely. And, yeah. you know, I, I, I have this saying with my team, if, what's the last thought you have when you're laying on your pillow at night, you know, and, and or at least your last work thought. Right. And, and, you know, a lot of times that last work thought is the thing I couldn't fix, not the thing I did. I, I rarely dwell on the things that we're successful at. I, I, I hear them and, and then they're gone. Like right. if they're working, they're so far right. out of my mind. I, right. I don't know if that's a character flaw, but I, I immediately transition to, hey, what didn't I solve today for that yeah. person who tomorrow has to show up to the front desk or get on the phones or clean a room and, and we didn't solve their problem and, right. and their job is just as hard tomorrow as it is today. And, yeah. and that's the hard part for me and that's the okay. thing I lose sleep about. You're a, you were a big part of that love initiative. Like you, you were like a celeb kind of going around place to place, right? You, you did a lot in a very compressed amount of time, true? So yeah. what was that like? Like what was that initiative like? Did you like it? Did you feel like at some point you could, you were dreaming about it, you could say it in your sleep? I definitely think at the end, any one of us could have given the speeches of anyone else on, on, on the okay. group. Like, so if they put a Brian Waltrip name tag on me and you're a Jared good. Saft you're on good. Mark, I think we all could have like given each other speeches. Okay. Uh, I think there's a lot of things we did right and some things we did wrong. Um, I think we tried to do a lot very fast, which was yeah. great. I mean, yeah. we're all busy people and we wanted to touch as many people as we possibly could. Yeah. The thing I didn't like is I wish I had gotten more time to actually talk to the people in each destination. Yeah. And, and because of, we were trying to do, you know, 27 resorts in four days. You know, it was, was it, really that? It, it was, and it, it, it was, Who came up with that? I, I don't know, I don't ask questions, I just go. Um, but, you know, we'd get off the plane, we'd give our speeches, we'd talk a little bit to the team, answer some questions, right. and then it was back in the cars, back in the plane, next city. Right. In terms of rolling out the mission and getting people excited about where we wanted to go, right. I think it was great to get everyone on the same page and every city kind of, you know, had their own spin on it and, yeah. you know. Yeah. All right, so listen, this is serious. Okay. We are going to give you some situational questions and I want you to be honest. Okay. 
Okay. Okay, there's a couple scenarios here. These are real. I've watched them happen on property. I want to know what you do. There's a guest who went to check in early, but the room is not ready. And listen, they have traveled from across the country. They even stopped and went to the grocery store. They got groceries in the car, Jared. Groceries. And there's quite a few kids. And they're not happy. And you're there. What do you do? The first thing I would do is provide empathy. You know, you got to make sure they genuinely believe that you understand what they're going through. Because in reality, all of us have been there. Um, you go above and beyond. You can do the right thing the right way and you can do the, the wrong thing the right way. And in this right. case, you get the perishable groceries and you find a way to stick them in a fridge somewhere. You, you find that thing in that moment that whatever it is, you get them some popcorn. And sometimes we're restricted in what we're able to do, but empathy, respect, save the groceries most importantly right. because they, right. you know, that right. there's right. ways we can solve that problem. I mean, right. that is a solvable problem. Uh, and, and if it, you know, get them, get them in the water park if you got a water park. Get them, you know, somewhere where they can obfuscate their time a little bit. But, okay. you know, th th that's how I would approach it. All right, Jared. Yeah. Time for rapid fire. Okay, here we go. Wine, beer, or liquor? Easy, Japanese whiskey. Didn't see that one coming. <laughs> the whiskey, I'm not surprised, but the Jap... Is there a difference? Oh, definitely. Slacks or sweatpants? Uh, my sweatpants. Ice cream or cake? Ice cream. Okoe or Wendover? Okoe. Disney or Universal? Universal. Just because it's easier to park and get in. Steaks or burgers? Steaks. Favorite thing in your closet? I have a, a Halloween costume of Marty McFly with the jacket from Back to the Dude, Future really? 2 and the hat and the whole thing and I love that. Favorite resort? Would have to be Westgate River Ranch because I always tell people those are not like hospitality employees pretending to be cowboys. Those are cowboys pretending to be hospitality employees. I, I mean, it is super authentic. I mean, okay. these are these are rodeo people. These are horse people, and they just happen to have guests walking around. So, love okay. that place. Who do you look up to? I look up to a lot of people. Um, I look up to my father-in-law, Jim Gissy. You know, he's been with the company for yeah. a really long time, yeah, he's a guy sure. and um, he has an approach to life that, you know, kind of lets a lot of negative things bounce off him. Yeah. Um, I look up to David, truthfully, because he has a level of perseverance that is unmatched. I mean, you know, there were nights, you know, in the past 13 years, when, you know, things are good, things are bad, and he just, he has this cool, calm, and collected, you know, air about him. Yeah. And that's not something that comes naturally to me, and, and I, I look up to him for that. Um, I look up to Mark because he is just, I, I was, he's like the most interesting man in the world. Like he's yeah. got a million talents and he was the one that really taught me that I need to have other interests outside of work, you know, wow. and, and not to get bogged down just by work. So that's another good piece of advice you were given. Absolutely, because you need an outlet and, and I didn't have one. And I look, I look up to Tom because there could be a lot yeah. of noise going on and, yeah. and ultimately Tom just knows how to stay right in the middle and just focus on what's important and, and so there's things about different people that I really look up to. I will tell you this, I like talking to you for real. Even if this wasn't happening, I really you do like right, I like I really like you. I liked you when I first met you, but I appreciate you taking your time. This is this is gonna help some people. You got a lot of people that are curious about what you do and the whys behind it. And I think this is gonna help us get that message out. And there's some very, very good advice that you're giving that's been imparted to you as well. So again, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time. And that's it. What video are you gonna watch next? No need to click away. Keep it here, watch Westgate Insider.